Hello, my name's Nick Hodgkinson, and this is the back of my cat, Pixie. And I'm Nick's partner, Juliet. So when was the first time you heard about the procedure? Um, the first time was with a consultant. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry, I can't talk. When we went to see a consultant anaesthetist before I was going in to have a peg tube operation because it was one of the things that might go wrong that I didn't really expect it to. Um, and how did you feel about the procedure when you first heard of it? Um, well, obviously it's a bit scary because you don't want to think that you can't breathe on aged. Um, but like I say, I have to be honest, and so I didn't think very much about it because it seemed such an unlikely prospect. Um, and how have your thoughts about the procedure changed over time? Um, well, quite considerably. <laughs> um, I actually had to have it put in in the emergency because I had um, a respiratory arrest that led to cardiac arrest and I was um, not breathing, my heart not beating, but brought around with CPR. Um, and it was put in during an emergency operation in intensive care. Um, I had had a good conversation, not just with the anaesthetist, but with my specialist nurse prior to the operation, where I was pretty clear that if there was anything went wrong and there was a procedure that could bring me back to a reasonable chance of decent life, that I would have that. So. I'm extremely pleased that we had that conversation and I'm extremely pleased that that procedure was carried out. But would you recommend this procedure to someone else who would be in a position such as yourself? Uh, totally. I mean, I know everybody has different attitudes to what they want from life and what is an acceptable quality of life, um, and so do I. But I am completely clear that having the tracheostomy put in has saved me, not just from dying, but from a really poor quality of life that might otherwise have resulted. And actually, I'm doing all right now. From my perspective, we uh, Nick had gone into hospital for this <laughs> operation on his peg tube, and that was successful. Fortunately, we'd had all these discussions before the operation with the consultant anaesthetist and with the specialist MND nurse. So we were aware of possible things that could go wrong in that operation. And all of that had been documented and, and noted. Yeah. And then what happened was Nick developed pneumonia while he was in hospital, recovering. And so then you had this breathing crisis and your heart stopped and you needed CPR. And that, that happened in the morning. And um, very quickly I was brought in to conversations with um, a different, uh, I think, consultant anaesthetist about the fact that the only way that they could be sure that they could manage your secretions um, with the pneumonia and the motor neuron disease was um, through having the tracheostomy and fortunately I was really well supported by Claire the specialist MND nurse but at the time you had were very heavily sedated I think because and you you had a um, like a tube th through your mouth yeah. to help you breathe so you couldn't speak um, you were quite out of it. You were. Um, you can't remember anything from that day. Nothing. But we did give you a whiteboard, and we did say, you know, do you want the tracheostomy? Yes. Yeah, yes or no was written on the whiteboard, and you had to tick yes or no. And you did. You know, you could barely write, but you did kind of tick yes. Um, but fortunately, we also. I mean, Claire was brilliant that day because she just talked through a lot with me. The the staff in the ICU were really good as well, and they talked through what you know the pros and cons of having it done. Um, but their professional opinion was that without it, 
you could risk getting choked up again and, and your breathing stopped and your heart stopping again. So, uh, so it was pretty clear to us that actually your wishes in that situation would be to go ahead with it. Yeah. Um, and that's what they did and later that day. Did you feel like you understood what having a tracheostomy would mean um, after? I didn't think that far ahead actually. Um, um, the thing is with mixed motor neuron disease you only got your diagnosis about um, two, two months. months before all this happening and it was progressing, you were progressing downhill very rapidly with the motor neuron disease. Yeah. So I, I, going at that rate I didn't see that you were going to survive very long in any case. Yeah. So my thinking around that time was all pretty short term about what was going to make you feel most comfortable. Um, and actually what's happened since then is your motor neuron disease seems to have kind of plateaued out. Mm -hmm. and, and now that you're, you've got the ventilator, you've got the peg tube, you've got the ventilator, you're, um, you, know, you seem to be much more... Uh, okay with motor neuron disease as well yeah. so I was, I, I was really clear <coughs> with um, the pre-operation discussions with Claire the nurse and Juliet um, that if there was something that gave me the chance even if just to come back round and decide I don't want it <coughs> I would take that chance because I wanted to make as good a choice as I could about what kind of life I would have left but but not having the opportunity to make that choice because of not having a procedure would have been stupid and self-defeating so I was always clear if I've got a chance to bring me back round to the to a state of consciousness where I can make a choice I want that mm. and it worked. How did you feel like immediately after the procedure? Um, do you allow swear words? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> I felt absolutely lousy. I mean, like I say, I didn't know it was being put in. I didn't know anything. I just woke up with a raging heat in um, the intensive care unit with a big bit of plastic in my mouth, in my throat, not knowing what the hell it was. Still quite sedated, and I felt absolutely terrible. And I've got to say that. <clears throat> that feeling of God, is it really worth carrying on, lasted, I don't know, I lost track of time, but probably a good week. Yeah. Certainly I was in intensive care for a week before we moved on, and that was awful. <laughs> um, but, you know, bit by bit, you get better, and I had to get used to having this thing in my neck, and... But once I kind of got me back sufficiently working to understand what people were telling me, and they were very clear and very helpful and very, I don't know, just patient in telling me several times probably why it was there and what it was doing. Slowly you get your head around it and think, OK, so it's this, or I can't breathe. And then you think, actually, I always said, I want to get back to a position where I can have enough mental capacity to choose what I do. So as my general health got better, so my mental capacity to think, OK, this really matters, this is really helping, and just getting used to it over the days made a really big difference. And, um, yeah, I got, just got, got into it, I suppose, got in sync with the breathing. That was a weird thing where you have to th actually concentrate on when you breathe in and when you breathe out because it's got to be in time with the ventilator mm. it's not very hard and now it's completely i don't notice it but at first it's something i really you know needed to think about and was quite odd mm -hmm. you said you struggled with it initially how yeah. long did it take for you to get used to it do you say um hmm. Again, it was difficult. I was in such a bad state that, that time kind of lost a bit of meaning. But I would say it was a couple of weeks before I was fully cognizant that 
this was really important, this was worth it, and actually it was ever so slowly starting to feel better. And um, after you left hospital, yeah. how easy was it to get home? Did the, did the care change? You start. Um, <laughs> well, when before Nick went into hospital, um, I was looking after you. Um, and uh, your needs were getting increasingly, uh, you, you had increasing needs because of your mobility and everything else and you were using a ventilator with a mask at night yeah. um, and um, actually that was getting harder and harder because of the motor neuron disease. But you weren't even using a wheelchair before you went into hospital. No. You came out of hospital, you had a wheelchair, you had the tracheostomy, you were permanently attached to a ventilator. Mm -hmm. So all of that was new. And a peg. And you had the peg tube, yeah. Uh, so within six weeks a lot had changed. But um, the other thing was you had 24-hour care from carers. Um, so I wasn't on my own looking after you. No. Um, and we had a lot of good support from um, district nurses and uh, local uh, services and specialist MND people like the physio and the occupational therapist. So... Um, it was a really big change. Palliative care consultant. Uh, yeah, it was a really so. big change, but you've got to remember it wasn't just because of the tracheostomy, you know, a hell of a lot had gone wrong with me in a short space of time. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a big deal getting moved out of hospital and my life and my care before and after are just hugely different, um, mm -hmm. but still, you know, really decent quality. Yeah. So we've got a lot of equipment now. <laughs> And wherever we go, we take a lot of equipment with us. Yeah. Um, suctioning your chest secretions is a big one. Yeah, talking of which. Um, <coughs> managing saliva. <laughs> Well, I know I'm talking now, and that's because I'm using a voice valve, which is brilliant, and it does allow me to just talk fairly normally. Um, I can use that for a few hours a day. I was initially told, you know, no more than 20, 30 minutes, which we did stick to at first. Um, but as I've got used to it, and I've got used to the limits of it, I use it, um, well, for at least a few hours, mm. but not every day. I mean, I suppose I could use it every day, but the downside is it does take qu probably a good half an hour to, to, not so much to put it in, but to get used to the um, fact that there's air now going through my mouth, mm. and that involves a lot of um, solid secretions coming up through my mouth, and a lot of coughing, and a lot of suctioning. And when I do use it, um, I still need a, a fair amount of regular suctioning the secretions out of my mouth. So it's not without work. Um, so generally, you want to think, I'll do that for a few hours when there's a good reason not we want to talk about mm -hmm. something to do with the house or we've got friends coming round or like today. Because mm -hmm. it, it is so much nicer to be able just to talk to mm -hmm. people and mm -hmm. respond quickly. And but when I can't talk, because I don't, I can't have it in all of the time, um, it is quite frustrating. And um, I can tell you, if you want, about how I do communicate. Is that useful? Yes. Okay. Um, oh, the cat's in the way. Shall I, <laughs> Shall I set it up for you? When I was in hospital, I was given a whiteboard, which was useful, because um, I could still hold uh, a marker pen well enough to write. Um, and it was the only way at the time for me to communicate because I, I wasn't using a voice valve then. And since then I've downloaded um, 
an app called uh, Full Screen Text. Oh no, text full screen, that's it. And it looks like this, as my beautiful assistant will show you. <laughs> now, <coughs> hold on just a second. It's basically a, a, an app on the phone that allows me to type words, and I'm quicker at that mm -hmm. than I am at writing on a whiteboard. And over the, well, it's been 18 months now that I've had the tracky in, um, and over that time, I've considerably built up my speed at typing with one thumb. Um, but, but like I say, slowly, I've got faster at using this, and Juliet and my friends and everyone's got more used to the way that I now need to communicate when I haven't got my voice valve in. And we've all just kind of adjusted, really, and, and it's, it's not that bad. Your carers lip read a lot of the time what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not very good at lip reading, but I've got a bit better than I was at first. <laughs> who, so who helped you train to be able to use the voice hour? Um, you you it, used it in hospital I with the physiotherapist. Yes, it would have been the physiotherapist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then she taught you yeah. how to put it in. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote a really detailed step-by-step -step idiot proof guide. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like most everything now. As long as you've got the equipment and you've thought about it and you're prepared, you can manage it. And that does mm -hmm. take some getting used to. But, you know, be a bit organised, be a bit confident about it and make sure you've got the right gear. And if you're concerned about it, don't do it until you've got chapter and verse from an expert and they've done it and shown you how to do it and you're confident, but it is worth it. Yeah. Um, how confident did you, did you two feel with the change of care and the procedures? Did you feel well informed about them? Um, yeah. I did feel, I, I felt like I was well informed and shown carefully how to do everything. Um, it was still really scary when it first came out of hospital because it was going from a high dependency unit which was right next to intensive care and you'd had a couple of breathing blockages yeah. even like two weeks before discharge, like quite recently really before yeah. you were actually discharged home. So, um, so it was very scary. But but I do feel I was well prepared and it was okay in the end, you know. I thought um, I thought the training mm. that the nursing staff gave you in the hospital was great. It was really good. There was lots yeah. of different people yeah. involved yeah. and nobody minded spending that time showing it to you. That's right, yeah. And also you're just dead good at it. <laughs> Oh, thank true. you. I don't always feel like I'm dead good at it. You are, actually. You put it up really quick. Mm. And mm. I know you weren't confident with it, but you, I, honestly, I, on the receiving end, knew that you were doing it mm. absolutely the same way that, that you know, long trained nice. medical staff were doing it. Mm. So, nice one. <laughs> yeah. Mm. And how did this affect your daily activities? Uh, well, enormously. Um, I was in a pretty bad way with the motor neuron disease affecting my lungs and my arms and my neck muscles before going into hospital, but I was still breathing independently. I was still walking um, independently. Um, and um, I obviously could talk whenever I wanted to. So afterwards, I, I now have to use a wheelchair pretty much all the time, though I can walk short distances with a frame. I can talk only when I've got the voice valve in. Um, and I need to have this uh, blue thing that supports my chin because my neck muscles just don't work. So when my head falls forward, I can't lift it back up again. So doing that makes it possible for me to stay upright and looking around. But it is an immense difference. Um, in sept I, I had the operation in February. The previous September, I'd cycled 100 miles. So that's, you know, and I was working very full-time in Citizens Advice Bureau. 
And so it was a tremendous difference in the space of a few months. <clears throat> um, and how was the support to getting used to it? We talked about it a little bit. Um, I thought it was really good. Um, I could say there's a lot of the acclimatisation, as it were, to my physical condition and my psychological ability to get me head around that. And then there was a lot of work went on with adult social care to arrange my discharge and get care I was in. And for you, Juliet, there was a lot of support and training, um, which I think it's probably better that you talk about. Um. Well, um, there was the support and training was mostly in the hospital before you got discharged, um, being shown by nurses how, and the physios how to do the uh, cough assist and the suction. Yeah. Um, but also, um, I got support from, I suppose, the, um, when, you, when you came out from the physiotherapist. Yeah. Um, who's a specialist motor neuron disease physiotherapist and um, what one thing we found that we had a lot we've had a lot of issues with Nick's uh, the site of Nick's trachea oh, yeah. being first of all very over granulated which means there's a sort of very tender skin around it um, and then um, now it's very leaky isn't it so yeah. that's not completely settled down you've had a few infections on the skin around your trachea yeah, yeah. we've well, also had some very good care from the care company we have we've yeah, had some really, really good care really good yeah. care yeah. so. we, we do need 24 yes. 7 care <laughs> um, and we get it and you know some of the carers are just fantastic in fact most of the carers are just fantastic and the other thing that I think might be useful if you're thinking about this yourself as, mm. as a person where you're considering having a trichostomy put in, and we had a lot of friends and family help. You yes. know, just, just mm. not with the technical stuff, not, not with the <clears throat> medication or cleaning the trichostomy or any of that, but just being around mm. and doing other stuff that we didn't have time or couldn't physically do anymore. Um, and that made an enormous difference. So, you know, the, the role of friends and family, I think, is really it's important. Really important, yeah. Do you mind talking us through a little bit through the routine? Like, how do you care for it? Yeah, well, every morning um, I have a cough assist. There's a machine that basically blows air into your lungs and then pulls air out, and it helps you to cough up secretions, which you don't want to be mm. leave, leave, left sat there. Um, so that's really useful, and it does definitely help to clear stuff out. It's, um, it seems a bit scary at first, because it involves having a small um, catheter tube put down your throat um, um, through the through tracheostomy. But that's really important, because then that takes the gunk out of your throat, and you don't all feel better for it afterwards. <clears throat> it also then gets cleaned um, using... A, a, not <coughs> using kind of cool board water and and a gauze um, we don't have to change the tracky dressing and there's usually quite a lot of um, decretions and gunk just on that so that takes a little bit of time and I usually need <coughs> um, other what we call deep suction so it's putting that tube down the tracky into your throat to suction out the secretions <coughs> and mouth suction and the morning is a bit secretion even um, but it's usually settled down after a couple of hours of getting sorted. Does that sound about right? Yeah, um. yeah. Um, and then the, then after that, you once you're up and dressed, we do the tracky dressing, which is like um, a process of wipe, cleaning everything around there and then putting new dressings on. Okay. The actual <coughs> taking the whole thing out and putting it back in, oh, yeah. that's a procedure that's done once a month um, by um, Martin Latham, who's a specialist nurse who comes 
from the sleep service at St James's. He's the fastest tracky changer in the West. <laughs> yeah, and he comes to our house once a month and um, Nick always has a playlist ready of particular tracks yeah. that to listen to and um, he does do it very speedily. He, in, we, we just um, get all the stuff out and he quickly, you know, it takes less than a minute really to take the old one out yeah. and put the new one in. Much later. Procedure. Yeah, the difference between the first time I had it done when I was still in hospital mm -hmm. and the last time I had it done a week or two back is immense. Um, but now it's like in and out. Mm -hmm. Just barely, I mean, it's uncomfortable, but it's not at all painful. In what other way has the tracheostomy affected your life? Um, the main one is, is not being able to talk when you want, and that that does, you know, I do still find that frustrating because the speed of a conversation is so quick that you only really notice it when you have to join in by typing. But, you know, it certainly doesn't outweigh all the benefits of having a tracheostomy in, which, you know, it means I can breathe which you kind of have to do. Um, I can breathe easily, I can fill my lungs, um, and I can carry on with doing all of the other things I like, even though there's a bunch of things I like I can't carry on doing, but hey, that's the way it goes, isn't it? Can I just interrupt there? You can. Um, there's maybe some a difference between, some things are down to having the ventilator permanently yes. attached, Whereas the alternative would have been to use a ventilator with a face mask, which obviously would interfere a lot with your um, with your communication as well. Yeah. Um, and you'd have the the mask on your face or probably yeah. all the time actually. Mm -hmm. So compared to that, it's at least this way. You know, you've not got anything over your face. No, indeed, um, that is much better. But, but the fact that you're permanently attached to a ventilator yeah. does mean that, you know, if you get up and walk, somebody's got to carry the ventilator with you. Yeah. Um, if you have a shower, we've got to somehow work around having a piece of yeah. electrical equipment attached to you. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, obviously there's, um, yeah, the there's quite a few issues with that. And, um has the tracheostomy affected any of your holiday plans? <laughs> yep. Again, it's not really just the tracheostomy, it's the tracheostomy attached to the ventilator and me needing to use a wheelchair, so the whole package does make quite a considerable difference to um, where you go, how long you go for, uh, what you need to do to prepare. Um, our life is now largely based around big lists of things to do and a checklist of stuff that we need to take with us because we do have to have a lot of kit. Uh, um, yes, to go away we take a lot of stuff with us. I mean we have to have the spare ventilator and a cough assist machine, a suction machine um, and loads of suction catheters. Um, all the breathing equipment we have in duplicate um, just in case something goes wrong yeah. as well as all, all obviously other equipment to do with like the feed and all the other things that you need so we've got a, a wheelchair accessible vehicle now and that is packed yeah. up to the rafters <laughs> and Nick's normally boxed in with like yeah. boxes all around you aren't you yeah. when we go on holiday and so far we've only been away for, maybe the longest was four nights and we went to Scotland and stayed in a self-catering place and for four nights. Yeah, I mean, I think for, <coughs> for again, for the benefit of anybody <coughs> who's not yet got a track here and might end up having one, mm -hmm. I would really want to say don't be put off. Um, we go out loads, absolutely loads. Mm -hmm. We go to watch live music a couple of times a week, we go to the countryside, we go to our lovely local park, we go to see friends, we go to parties. Like Juliet said, we, we've been away, what, four or five times, I think, for a long weekend. <clears throat> um, 
I go to the villa for what it's worth when I can um, and actually our first major trip after I came out of hospital was about two months mm. after I came out and it was Wembley um, mm. for football and it was it was a big undertaking mm. but it was fantastic and we did it and you mm. just need to get quite organised. My t top tip would be once you've made a big list of things to do or a big list of things to take out with you, don't lose it yeah. because you can use that again and I do it on my phone so that if I've got to amend it because it's a slightly different thing I'm going to or going for a slightly longer amount of time and it's already on there and you just got to amend it <clears throat> and I then rely on Juliet and carers to pack everything up and sort it which does take a while but it's just a matter of being a bit organised and being a bit confident and you can still have a crack in life. Um. <clears throat> The next question is a bit of a hypothetical. If hypothetically um, you were to be in a position to consent for a tracheostomy with the experiences you've had now, what would your answer be? No, oh, definitely. Yeah, no, without doubt, I would have done that. Um, if I would, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have seen my team must have really get promoted. <laughs> I wouldn't have seen loads and loads of really good gigs. I wouldn't have got out and seen the Yorkshire Dales again. You know, there's so much I wouldn't have been able to do. Now, I appreciate that I've been, in some respects, and I wouldn't have had the cat shouting at me. <laughs> um, in some respects, I'm lucky because my condition has very much stabilised and I, know, I have Juliet and good friends and good carers and you know, a great medical team and all of that. But even if I, I know, even if I hadn't had that, um, Without having the tracky put in, I wouldn't have had the chance to get back to a condition where I could have said, look, I don't want this. Mm -hmm. At least I have been able to make that choice, and the choice I have made has meant that I've had still a really good quality of life. <laughs> and is there any other incident or memory which you'd like to share? Uh, yeah, well, we're um, <clears throat> quite involved with a group called Extinction Rebellion, who do a lot of campaigning about the climate crisis and recently there was uh, quite a long protest in London and we did go down, we couldn't stay for all of it, um, but we did go down for the first couple of days, uh, which is very wet, um, but still very worthwhile. And um, talking about can you still do things that you want to do with your life with a tracheostomy? Well, yes, because I chose to get arrested for blocking a road outside of Parliament, which was part of the aim of the protest. And it was actually really funny to see the look of horror on the arresting officer's face when he said, oh, seriously? I, I mean, he didn't say this, but you could see in his face, well, I really have to arrest you. <laughs> um, and I gave him a letter which uh, has been kindly produced by um, someone from the NHS Trust explaining all of the conditions I have and the things I need in order to be kept safe and they just had absolutely no idea what to do with me. So I was um, allowed to remain in the road, um, probably the only person blocking that part of the road, for four hours until um, we had to go because one of the machines was running out of electricity and then I was formally de-arrested and uh, sent on my way. <laughs> it was, you know, extraordinary that I can still do that sort of thing, and I know you might not agree with it, but it shows you that what you can do with your life, even with a tracheostomy, if that's what you want to do. Um, I, I think it's probably the best one. You might disagree, but for me, mm. the best one was uh, getting to Wembley, outside Wembley, with a whole bunch of really drunk Aston Villa fans, <laughs> some of whom I'd uh, kind of got to know through a Facebook group. Oh, and, yes. and quite a few of them, who I've never met in real life, just coming up and like going, good on you lad, you know, <laughs> well done mate, come on, we're going to win this. And, uh, and then we did, and we went up, um, the celebrations afterwards were just astonishing. So to be able to have kind of 
said, look, I'm not letting a tracky officer with a disability stop me getting to Wembley. And then meet a whole bunch of people who I'd never met in my life, but were fellow, you know, Villa fans. And then to win it was just like, oh, yeah, come on, this is what it's all about. <laughs>